Welcome to Feminist Question Time, brought to you by Women's Human Rights Campaign, which is an international feminist organization that promotes women's rights. The main focus is on defending women's sex-based rights against the threats posed by gender identity ideology. You can find more information on the website womensdeclaration.org where you will find our declaration on women's sex-based rights. The declaration has been signed by more than 16,000 people from 130 countries and is supposed by 321 organizations. I'm Stephanie Bode, I'm the country, country contact in Germany and the guest host of today's webinar. So the first speaker will be Alex Aharon from Israel. She's the founder of the Gender Mapper and co-founder of Partners for Ethical Care, an advocacy group challenging the affirming medical approach for children with gender dysphoria. And after her, we have we hopefully hear from Yua Na Nakamoto from Japan. She's an aspiring writer for Women's Voices, publishing short stories on Wattpad and other Japanese media and websites. Then we hear two speakers from Belgium, Vanessa McCullough, who's an educator, and Ellie, who's a female detransitioner and co-founder of Post Trans a project giving resources and visibility to female detransitioners. If you're watching this with a child or watching this with a child nearby, or if you're um, kind of upset by uh, you know, frightening images, um, you know, please don't continue to watch this. Uh, my presentation is very much focusing on the harms being done to women and children uh, by gender identity ideology and um, it's absolutely not suitable for children or anybody who is triggered by um, by adult content, adult material. I'll give everybody a couple of seconds. All right, so uh, my name is Alex Aaron. I'm the co-founder of Partners for Ethical Care and the founder of the Gender uh, Mapper Project. I want to thank everybody for giving me the opportunity to give my analysis and experience on what is going on in the world of online gender dysphoria. So how does the modern system look? For now, know that every border you cross, every purchase you make, every site you visit, every friend you make, and every site you search is accessible by companies whose reach is unlimited and whose safeguards are not. Most of what I do and what I look at is actually pretty fun. It's looking at puzzles and solving problems. And that's what I like to do. I'd like to look at data and systems. And I've developed a concept of analysis for online gender dysphoria, where you can lay it out in such a way that it can be coded and executed electronically. So this means that it's essentially automating the analysis. And this can be done with metadata and metadata relationships. Uh, numbers are constantly thrown at us in relation to gender clinics. And I think that that's a very important thing to focus on is numbers and data and facts. In 2013, we believe that there were less than 10 clinics in the United States. In 2016, there were believed to be 50. Today, as it stands, there are over 300 gender clinics in North America. So it should come as really no surprise to us that the exponential rise in gender clinics is a result of patients. Uh, it has its roots in social media. And for example, in 2016, the co-founder uh, of, of Tumblr joined the board of Planned Parenthood. To anybody who understands Tumblr, hashtags and metadata, it should have horrified us that a social media network is getting into bed with a healthcare provider. Tumblr is one example um, of where there are communities and hashtags which are the source of illness, despair, and negatively affect teenage girls. This has prompted them in 2015 to isolate and effectively ban certain hashtags 
for example, um, thinspiration. Okay, so thinspiration is a former hashtag which existed on social media, which was causing women to be really distressed about their, um, you know, their physical appearances and actually developing uh, anorexia. So this is a known problem. This is existing. It's there. Um, girls can go on, click on hashtag thinspiration, and then they'll be desperate upset about their their bodies okay it's 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 known they've banned these types of hashtags before um so hashtags like this exist online and now they're being used by gender clinics so i believe that social media is totally complicit in its ad advertisement to young confused women and it doesn't end there um, for years now, there are unbelievable and, uh, numbers of, of, of clinics that are actually targeting insecure young women. Um, you know, it, and this is really primarily in Western communities. Okay, this exists in, in Western communities. Is it, children are not, um, young women in Africa are not thinking that they're born in the wrong body. Okay. Okay, so we have to totally reject this notion that this is in any way biological or real or, you know, this is this is very much caused by uh, social factors. Okay, so um, with my presentation, I really want to get into the history of, of gender dysphoria and kind of how we have been uh, tricked into accepting this as a real, you know, a, as a genuine thing that, that occurs um, naturally, because it's, it's really anything but, um, but, uh, but natural. Okay. All right. So um, this is just a little bit into the history of, of gender uh, dysphoria. Okay. So the first clinic opened in secret in 1969, and this was primarily to see hypergender dysphoric young males. Um, and, you know, this, this was very much um, something which was affecting young, young boys, um, which there was, you know, very, very few of these young boys actually, even at the time. Then uh, in 1971, there was the creation of GNRH, which is a puberty blocker uh, to treat um, early kind of puberty from happening. And it was, um, you know, they, they said it was to, if a girl was to all of a sudden start going through puberty at six, you know, socially, this wasn't good for her. But, um, you know, really there's actually no known men, physical side effects of going through an early puberty and it remains in use to this day off label. So all of this has happened incredibly recently with this concept of treating children um, medically with, uh, with kind of, you know, puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. Um, in 2007, uh, Boston Children's Hospital began transitioning young children through its clinics. Um, and their youngest patient was three years old. And it really, really started to speed up um, in, in the coming years. And I, I'd link that directly to the data, which is available online um, about uh, gender dysphoria. Okay, so in 2006, um, Planned Parenthood entered into the mix and um, the the CEO of Tumblr um, joined the board of Planned Parenthood and led a massive funding event um, with the hashtag uh, Planned Parenthood in tech. Uh, from there, they started to offer quote unquote LGBT services. Now, these are not LGBT services. This is hormones, okay, um, with no therapy, no referrals and no evaluation. In 2018, abortion rates nationwide had gone down by 18%. So Planned Parenthood really should have been thinking, okay, this, this looks like, you know, maybe people are, are not um, using more contraception, you know, things are, you know, there's, there's no, um, they should have been happy, you know, about that. And that the nation's number one provider, they showed absolutely no loss in fi finance because of this. So with, with Planned Parenthood and Tumblr, this is like a, this is like just two very, uh, what would seem, up, you know, things which should never meet, okay? A healthcare provider such as Planned Parenthood getting into bed with a social media network, okay? It's so strange, so foreign, 
And it, it's for, from the moment it had this bad romance, okay? Um, and it should come as no surprise that Tumblr has decided to get involved in this. Okay, um, so Planned Parenthood, and by the way, I'm not singling Planned Parenthood by this. Um, there's there's 800 clinics in the US that are, that are kind of doing this informed consent model. Um, but Planned Parenthood is the one that has the, the most reach. Um, now, they, they have all of these kind of really insane things on their uh, informed consent forms. For example, they call a man a person who makes sperm. I don't really know what that means, but apparently that's a thing now. Um, now, they sort of make all of these kind of um, strange claims about, um, you know, about... Uh, about you know what necessarily are the benefits and um, and negative side effects of of testosterone in women. Um, now, as you can see here, you know they. I don't really know how they can sort of get away with making these claims. Um, so they 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 say that um, the the permanent uh, benefits are including um, baldness. I don't know how that is a uh, benefit, but apparently it is. And these are some uh, real um, testimonies that I received uh, from parents uh, as part of doing my research for the gender mapping project. Um, so really we can see there's some very bad things that are going on to young women um, through the, the system of gender affirmation. Okay. Um, so there is really what I think is really quite the scandal is there's there's no real need to investigate um, the really what I think are actually the homophobic um, motives uh, that a lot of parents uh, of young girls take their children to gender clinics for. Um, if you just speak for a few minutes to a lot of uh, parents, they'll tell you that their child, first of all, um, you know, thought they were lesbian, received a lot of backlash for this. Uh, and then, you know, went to the gender clinic. So I'm not really seeing how they don't make that, that connection there. Okay, now um, I managed to hijack quite a few of uh, the, um, the gender clinics, uh, sorry, uh, Planned Parenthood, they provide sex education through GLSEN. So they have this amazing, these amazing statistics here about rapid onset gender dysphoria and how it's um, disproportionately affecting girls. So um, this is what, this is the evidence that that um, that is out there about who are the patients that are going to these clinics. So ninety point nine percent of them are female, and they have an average age of fifteen and a half. OK, this was a sample that was done by uh, of 20,000 uh, gender dysphoric youth. So 20,000 young people that thought that they might be um, that they might be trans. This is actually the real statistics behind it. And, you know, they're sitting on these statistics and they're actually not doing any anything about it. Um, so there's just lots of, of harms that are directly, um, you know, directly going on here. Okay, so this is kind of where I want to go into the actual gender, uh, the actual gender map here, because that that is the story. You know, I'm not the story. The gender map is the story. Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, in 2013, there was known to be a handful of clinics uh, throughout the United States and indeed really throughout the world. Um, and it's and it's not correct to think about this as if it's a, this is a global issue that, that's happening to teenage girls and, and young people. So what, what does the map show? So the map shows, um, you know, 800 clinics in the United States and the purple are pediatric. The red have testimony and the orange are surgical. Now, this map is available online. Um, I've received a lot of sort of threats about the map, a lot of this is this. I don't know why, if it, but this information, people don't want it really to be out there. And um, the gender mapping project has actually called each one of these clinics to confirm uh, what they're doing. 
So I call up, I tell them that I have a, you know, a, a gender dysphoric child and that I want hormones and blockers. And I try to see how far I can actually get down, um, down the path of, um, you know, gender affirmation, gender confirmation. So this is the system which is behind, um, which is behind this. Okay. And, you know, if we're going to look at it from a, from a, you know, just from a data perspective, okay, you see, these are the gender clinics that are in the United States. Then you have a look at Europe and we can see really, you know, where they're concentrated um, and also who the, who the patients are. And social media is really playing a very, um, uh, you know, a very important part in all of this. And, you know, this is just one example of the gender surgeons um, that are available online um, that can be seen by, you know, your your 12 year old um, child, 13 year old child can be accessing this highly, you know, if anybody's triggered by stuff, please don't watch that. This is highly damaging, um, you know, highly targeted uh, advertisement that's been done to, to young children. It's really being sold as um, the, the, the one-stop shop for negative feelings about your body. Now, the thing that I mentioned at the beginning about the hashtags is really important here to kind of understand how children are uh, driven down, a, you know, essentially driven down a rabbit hole uh, a child might start out um, taking a look at, um, you know, the hashtag LGBTQ, and then it's they're only four or five clicks away from going down this total, you know, rabbit hole uh, on TikTok, where they can engage in, they can see, you know, very, um, very tempting um, advertisement that actually they can't, um, I don't believe that any child is is even capable of overpowering the amount of um, this this level of you know coercion essentially. So I think that I've reached my twenty minutes. Uh, so am I to hand uh, over? Am I to hand over now? Oh, you can go ahead. If we are not not um, not all guests are here yet, so if you need some more time, it's perfect to go ahead. Yeah, excellent. So great. So I'm actually just going to go back to the map now and show a little bit more information from here. So this map, I'm making it available um, online. This map can be accessed uh, by anybody. And the reason that I want it to be out there and accessed by anybody is because I want to hold um, those who are doing harm uh, to account. Uh, I think it's very important to always be able to name reality and also to name, uh, you know, to, to, to name those who are doing harm. Uh, so very recently, just this week in Arkansas, um, they actually um, made this, you know, fantastic claim uh, that there were no gender clinics in Arkansas and therefore no reason to actually limit um, puberty blockers. And I was able to take a look at my map and actually confirm that there are several, um, there are several gender clinics in Arkansas that are you know, deliberately, targeting, uh, deliberately targeting children and youth. And it was a really great um, success to, to actually have th that um, to actually have those those treatments banned um, this this week. Um, okay, so we also have a book um, that is that was released yesterday called Desist, Detrans, and Detox, uh, which is essentially a handbook for uh, for the parents of teenage uh, girls or teenage boys that have been caught up in this um, sort of maze, uh, and it's it's really to help everybody who has been negatively affected um, by this. Uh, the author Maria Keffler and Partners for Ethical Care, we are all people who have been deeply affected, uh, deeply affected by gender identity ideology in one way or another. Um, on, our, on our board, we have a detransitioner, uh, a mother, and also, um, you know, an activist. So this is, you know, something that which we, you know, desperately, desperately care about. Okay, 
So um, we can also see that with, with looking at data and with looking at metadata and also with looking at advertisements, um, it should come really as it really it, to no surprise to us that there are that these gender clinics exist in clusters. Um, they are generally clustered in um, in you know well-to-do kind of areas, uh, socioeconomic socio This map also has um, socioeconomic factors into it as well. Uh, the more sort of uh, the richer the area. Yeah, the more gender clinics, uh, the more gender clinics you have. Uh, a lot of people have felt it very, um, you know, very uh, helpful to actually get these stories out there. Um, most most of the time, when parents try to tell uh, their um, their stories that they had at gender clinics, people actually don't believe them. People tell them this didn't happen. Um, you know, I, I don't believe you. So the map actually gives um, the the power, kind of the megaphone to the to the victims and the megaphone to the people to sort of say, okay, here is a place where you can talk about your experience. Here is a place where you can talk about what has happened to you, and what actually went on at the hands of these doctors. And these 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 stories are nothing short of scandalous. Each one is is you know medical uh, negligence. Um, I have one story which I received from a mother in Australia um, who wrote um, 200 letters to her, gender, her daughter's gender surgeon to tell them uh, that her daughter is working in prostitution in order to fund this, um, these double mastectomies. And the, the gender surgeons just told her to, to stop writing. And I think that's really um, very, you know, indicative of a very normal, you know, a very normal testimony that I will receive. Yes. So these are sort of, um, I, I really encourage anybody um, to, to go through these, um, to go through the gender clinic uh, at MAP, to add your experience and um, to start really telling the truth about what is happening here. Uh, something is is obviously very wrong and it's been wrong uh, for years um, and it's it's you know being allowed to, um, to to go on with with no controls there's no there's no kind of board of directors that is overseeing um, the the level of, of social media uh, grooming that's going on there's there's nobody that's overseeing it um, at the very le at the very most, it's just going to be kind of um, maybe taken down for offensive content. But the stuff that I found online is really, really, really disturbing. Um, I feel like it's actually um, direct advertisement and pornography to to children. Um, so this is again like just more more information. Um, this particular surgeon here says that there are um, actually transgender babies. Uh, this this surgeon said that at 18 months you can say if a child is actually going to present with gender dysphoria, which is just a wild claim. Um, and again, she says it online. She has um, on her YouTube channel. Um, she 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 claims that because a child didn't want to have a, uh, a baby grow on, you know, wanted to open the baby grow to be a dress that was a, a quote unquote gender signal or whatever. And it's just total, I mean, really total nonsense to anybody who's ever picks up a book or spoken to a child. It's just, it, it, it makes absolutely no sense. Okay, so I think that if anybody wants to uh, to continue and talk to and kind of talk to me or, or know more about my work, you can go to partnersforethicalcare.com. I have another website which is transgenderabuse.org. Um, on Twitter, I am the Gender Mapper, where I tell true stories of what happens, of, of stories about transition uh, and stories. Um, you know, I want to get the truth out here about what is happening to young women and who is doing this to young women and why they're doing it to young women. The reason is they're making money off of it. Um, they're, they're making money from, you know, uh, from young, uh, impressionable and insecure young women, and it has to stop. And it will only stop if we continue to hold them account to, to account and continue to tell them to stop doing this, to stop marketing independent gender clinics to young women. It just, it has to end and it has to end uh, and it will end when we 
when we make sure that it ends. Thank you very much. Our next two speakers now from Belgium. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the situation in Belgium. So first it's Vanessa McCullough and then Ellie. So over to you, Vanessa. I'm a teacher in an international school in Belgium and I came to Belgium in 2006. Uh, I grew up in England. I studied and worked in Scotland. I worked in Scotland just in the state system. And then I moved to the Netherlands where um, I also worked in the international system. Um, I think my story with regards to um, becoming alerted to this issue probably follows a very similar trajectory to other people. Um, I know that many people have been discussing it much longer, but I think I probably was alerted to the problem, you know, when I saw Maria McLachlan assaulted by Tara Woods. Um, and then I further was, you know, um, Munro Bergdorf's assertion that women should not center their uh, female biology on International Women's Day. And then also Posey Parker's campaign and, and the sort of um, uh, horror that that's the words adult human female seemed to uh, cause people to have when she projected those as part of her activism on the building. Uh, in London. I was abused online for saying that male-bodied people shouldn't be housed in women's prisons in an opinion group that I was on and you know those sort of online spaces became kind of unavailable to me because of my views. Um, I followed the debate mainly in um, Britain because that's my uh, nationality and um, well my first nationality I became Belgian in 2016 and I was really inspired by um, what uh, happened there and the resistance that um, women have shown um, to uh, things like the uh, Gender Recognition Act and the consultation that occurred. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about Yogyakarta principles, EU, because obviously Belgium as a member state of the EU is influenced by uh, EU politics, and also a little bit about Belgium um, in um, as, as a country that now has self-ID without any supporting medical uh, documentation required for um, to change your uh, legal gender. So there are also tensions, for example, between SEDAR and uh, other EU uh, um, and EU policy direction. And I think some of these are characterized by something that many people would have noticed, which is that constant conflation of sex and gender in policy language and discussion, uh, which I think um, really uh, messes things up. The Yogyakarta principles were first established in 2006. Uh, they're constantly cited in various situations and documents as being best practice. Um, and they're often seen as the sort of origins of gender identity, um, starting to supersede the importance of sex um, and the promotion of gender identity or gender expression as uh, being as overriding the significance of sex. And they do have an influence on EU thinking. So. EU policy does not currently compel any uh, member state to um, adopt self-ID as their means of um, uh, changing, changing uh, your gender, but it's kind of encouraged. And I think if you look at the table there, you can see that you know, the countries that are in cluster five on the uh, table. These are kind of seen as leading the way and the implication is that other countries should aspire to this. These are the countries that all have already have self ID. Be Belgium, Denmark, Ireland, Luxembourg, Malta and Portugal. Uh, gender identity, gender reassignment, gender expression is not listed in Article 21 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which lists other bases of discrimination, the sort of thing that you would expect to see on such a list, sex, race, colour, ethnic or social origin, um, all of those uh, language, religion, uh, disability, all of those things that you would expect to see. 
So member states in the EU have to protect against discrimination on the basis of these characteristics. They can add additional ones if they wish to, but they can't take away those ones that are listed from those ones that are listed there. Article 23 refers to equality between men and women, and it does refer to sex. So the risk comes from adding gender identity characteristics in a way that conflates them with sex. So in the much talked about UK Equality Act of 2010, uh, the separate characteristic of gender assignment was added, but not placed alongside sex. It's a separate characteristic. All individual member states, but not the EU as a body, are committed to the implementation of uh, policy aligned to the goals and principles of CEDAW, the Istanbul Convention, which does have some reference to gender identity, but refers to men and women throughout and attributes female experiences, for example, maternity to women. It refers to the sexes, for example, in um, Article 5, although CEDAW also uh, committee also needs to provide real clarification. Here in Belgium, we have the Institute of uh, Equality of Men and Women. And there you can see that actually these things are very much um, conflated. All of the trans rights stuff, the issues, those issues and information are found alongside women's rights um, uh, issues and information. Uh, however, you can still bring gender identity cases under the auspices of the sex characteristic. And I think, you know, this is comparable to what Biden is doing now. Again, it's that kind of conflation, that, that placing of gender and sex together. So, for example, a trans woman, uh, a male born person claims discrimination on the grounds that they've been discriminated against because of their female sex, because they are a woman. Um, from this archived page, I found uh, an explanation from Sylvain Aegis in 2010, um, where he stated, luckily the case of the European Court of Justice fills the gap. He's referring to a lack of a legislation about trans rights. The court has interpreted discrimination on the basis of sex to also refer to people who have had gender reassignment. I think it might be worth considering that gender reassignment in 2010 might have uh, possibly meant something quite uh, different. Um, uh, I don't think it, it would have meant at the time, it may or may not have meant uh, a certificate on the basis of self ID. Um, so he's saying all EU sex discrimin discrimination law could thus apply to transgender people. Today, um, Aegis is on the uh, team of Helena Daly, who is the EU Commissioner for Equality. Also in the Council of Europe, um, policy moves in favour of gender ideology. And I just looked and gave an example there as an, uh, with reference to education, because that's my area, because that's, uh, you know, as a teacher, I think about how it applies there. And um, in one particular section, which discusses sex segregated spaces in schools, it, it's, it's discussed in a way that describes it as posing challenges for the trans identifying minor, but there's you know, pretty much no discussion uh, at all resolving about resolving issues in relation to the challenges that might be experienced by existing users. Um, there's, and this seems to characterize a lot of documentation that I see that, uh, that the trans identifying student, trans student is, is centered really in everything without, um, a sufficient consideration uh, of uh, or equal weighting given to um, those that are using the spaces already that the trans student would like to identify into as it were. There's some vague mention of this in point 35 that suggests that schools could have some flexibility. If we move on to Belgium, it's a very complicated uh, country. We have a population just of 11 million. We're a young country and we've got three different language communities and, um, and multiple parliaments and political and cultural differences between Flemish and Walloon communities. 
I live in Antwerp, uh, which is Flemish speaking, and it's really nice that Ellie, whose uh, presentation will follow mine, she's based in Brussels, so um, you are able today to get perspectives from um, the two major language communities. In Belgium, self-ID is allowed. Um, this law came into effect in 2018 from the 1st of January, and it means that no supporting medical documentation um, from a doctor or a, a counsellor is, is required to accompany applications. And it's available to Belgians aged 16 plus, although between the ages of 16 and 18, uh, minors are required to provide a short declaration signed by a child psychologist or psychiatrist. There's a reflection period. It's only about three to six months between the two declarations. On the next slide, you can see, you'll see a little time frame about how it happens. And all your markers get changed on your official documentation to the, your desired sex classification. Now, what's clear is that this is a process that's very difficult to reverse once the legal change has been made. Um, and this, I think, is the essential problem with it. Um, of course, the difficulty is there in order to prevent supposedly frivolous applications um, but I think it is going to be hugely problematic for um, uh, young people who perhaps become locked into identities uh, that no longer apply to them or at worst have become distressing to them um, in other words deep transitioners um, young people who uh, regret their decision and I think especially given the rising number of um, females presenting at gender clinics. Um, this is something that is, you know, a, a, a women's issue too. So it, the, to summarize the situation, it's quite easy in, in six months, you can change your uh, documentation, but the reversal is um, very difficult. And the next, this shows kind of the uh, start and end. I'm sorry, this is in Dutch. So the start involves putting your first declaration um, in at your local authorities. We have like a district house, gemeente, I think it's a commune in the French speaking uh, part of the country. And then um, it goes to the uh, procureur des I think the, uh, a king's attorney um, would be a good translation of that. Like when I changed, uh, not changed, but when I got Belgian nationality, um, it went to that um, office as well, my whole file when I applied for Belgian nationality. Then it comes back, uh, you put in a second um, um, declaration and uh, six months after the very start of the procedure, uh, you, you, the changes can be uh, happening. Here you can see uh, perhaps, um, you can see the, uh, there's a big spike when this change occurred. So a huge spike in uh, numbers of uh, people wanting to um, now uh, change their legal gender. And that's maybe something that might have been expected, although it is a, indeed a very uh, a high spike. Um, and, but you can also see a level of, leveling off of the um, sexes of the people that are applying for this procedure uh, to the extent the last one, the last blue column um, is, you know, you've got the same numbers of men and women, um, males and females applying. Um, so I'm in Flanders and in schools, um, all of my, I have three children, they're all in the Belgian system, I teach in the international system as I mentioned, but my three children are all at different stages, so I went to check out the um, official education website of Flanders, and there was a page about transgender students which actually outlined the changes in self-ID law and then looked at what that would mean in schools. To a certain degree, I think in some ways they are kind of fairly non-committal and not, um, uh, in, again, forcing schools to um, move 
people into uh, to to be allowed to always identify into sex segregated spaces. So in toilets, for example, um, the Schools aren't actually obliged to provide separate toilet facilities for boys and girls. The page suggests making toilets gender inclusive, in other words, mixed sex, as I would say. Um, and there's this constant reference to asking the student what they want and then seeing if it can be supported by the school, but always starting, again, centering the, the trans identifying student. Um, I think many of people watching will be aware that mixed sex toilets and are uh, less safe for girls. So as a teacher, again, that I would see that as a safeguarding concern, as I would for the next area, the, the PE lessons, um, asking the student what they um, prefer, but it does at least allow also for the, the necessity of consulting other students. It doesn't answer questions about playing on teams. It seems especially unsafe uh, I think for trans identifying females to be in contact sports and uh, also, you know, in teams when you play other uh, schools, I think there's an issue uh, for the team that you are playing against about how they would feel. And these things are not really resolved or answered on that. Uh, again, sleeping arrangement, um, it's as per, but emphasizes that a trans student who's advanced in the transition process is best placed according to the page with the group to which they are transitioning. And I think, again, that is a safeguarding concern. And I think, you know, it, we also need to remember that, you know, with all the, the sort of um, pressure on girls to be nice and be kind that uh, we're aware of, that even if you do consult girls and ask them what they, they think about, they might well feel a strong uh, pressure to say that they're comfortable when they're not. In conclusion, I, I haven't found much opposition to gender ideology here. And uh, when the law went through, for example, um, to say uh, the self-ID law went through, it just did not seem to provoke the reaction, for example, that it did in the UK, where it seemed to really light a touch paper under uh, feminism uh, uh, and feminists and who, who did an amazing job of, of highlighting the conflict between trans rights and women's rights. Um, I have great safeguarding concerns as a teacher and there are a couple of links there uh, where you might want to, uh, if you are in Belgium, you can contact a government department. And there's a list of MEPs uh, there as well. Uh, Transparencia is a site that I discovered recently uh, where you, it, it works like freedom of information. If you can't see the information that you want, uh, you could uh, put your request for information in there. Uh, I've kind of just tested that out recently. So I've put in, I've asked the uh, Justice Department how many uh, uh, trans identifying males are in women's prisons at the moment. And I'm waiting to see how the site works and if I get an answer with that. So that is the situation at the moment. I suppose uh, I've got a bunch of links and resources which you're, uh, which you're welcome to share. I suppose my key message at the moment might be for those people that are not in that cluster five of the um, diagram that we saw earlier, the table that we saw earlier, to just be aware how, how it seems that this, this legislation really just kind of glided silently in to Belgian law with very little opposition or um, discussion that I could identify in, in news or opinion pieces or in feminist groups. I'm going to touch on the topics of the situation for lesbians in Belgium. I'm going to talk about the gender ID services and I'm going to also talk a little bit about the topic on, of detransition. Um, so all of the information that I'm going to share in my presentation will be based on my own experiences and on my perspective as a female detransitioner. So who identified as a lesbian at the age, from the age of 14, then identified as a trans man and started to medically transition from the age of 16 to the age of 20, where I started to detransition. Um, as mentioned by Vanessa earlier, I um, grew up in Brussels um, and I'm French speaking. So um, everything that I will be talking about will be not focused on the French speaking side of Belgium. I try to research as much as much as possible on the Flemish side as well, uh, but it might be a bit influenced by that. I just wanted to be clear with that. 
So um, I'm going to start talking so um, about my own experiences. Uh, so as I said, I came out as a lesbian when I was 15. And uh, from that age, I started to search for, for other organiza for organizations where I could find other lesbians to talk to, to meet, to exchange with. And unfortunately, unfortunately I couldn't find anything. Um, I, um, I, was, I was searching and I could only find other types of organization, but nothing lesbian specific. And um, I still uh, share that same observation that today uh, lesbian organizations are very hard to find, um, lesbian specific organizations. So here I showed, for example, the Google results um, of uh, like when I search for Belgian lesbian organization, all of the, the all of the results are LGBT plus, LGBTQI, and it's really really hard to find something lesbian specific. I talk to other lesbians in Belgium, in the Flemish side and the French speaking side, and they share the same observation. Uh, in general, it's hard to find spaces that are lesbian specific. Um, so back to my uh, 15 year old self, um, I was questioning myself a lot and I was quite isolated as a lesbian. Um, and I started to ask myself, why don't I feel like a woman? Why, um, why am I more masculine than the other girls? Um, all of these kind of questions. So I started researching and this is how I found um, the website of a trans organization but uh, sorry, I, I missed some information that I wanted to mention before about lesbian organizations. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples of lesbian initiatives in Belgium and show you that, uh, unfortunately, for the most of them, they're not lesbian specific. And uh, for example, here you can see the L Festival, which uh, you could think is lesbian centered, but mo a lot of these events are actually focused on uh, trans people. For example, I checked their program here because so every year they organize a series of, as they say, lesbian, bi, trans and feminist events. And this year I, I looked at their program and in February they organized an event called Tea Tutorial that was aimed at um, teaching people how to self-inject testosterone. And it was organized by two uh, trans people without any supervision of a medical professional. Um, now another example of a lesbian space, uh, so Mothers and Daughters, this is a bar that opened a few years ago and that uh, was uh, simply called Mothers and Daughters and known as a lesbian bar. Um, and uh, recently it changed its name and now it's Mothers and Daughters, a lesbian and trans bar. Um, during the lockdown they had to close and the main activity that they've been doing was selling this new beer called Transition which, um, which they sell and all the proceeds go to a trans solidarity fund. So this is something that's very much not uh, about lesbians, even though this is an initiative uh, from a lesbian bar. So this is the kind of thing that uh, you're confronted a lot with as a lesbian in Belgium. So now I'm going to talk about the trans organization that I uh, mentioned earlier. So when I started questioning myself um, and I started researching on all the, these questions that I had about myself, I came across this trans organization. Uh, I saw on their website that they organized um, a counseling uh, appointments that you could book um, with a psychotherapist. So I decided to do that. I went there and um, I told them about the fact that I didn't feel like a woman, that I could not relate to the other girls and they directly told me about testosterone treatment and what this treatment could do to the appearance of my body. And uh, they told me about surgeries that were possible or not. And they gave me some flyers to help me come out as trans to my family. So now I'm gonna talk a bit more about this specific organization. They, uh, so they organize these, they have these counseling services in several Belgian cities and they also organize workshops to uh, raise awareness on the topic of trans identity. Um, on their website, they have a statement uh, in which they explain their positioning against the gender teams that are in Belgium. 
So in Belgium, there are two gender teams, one in Liège in the French speaking side of Belgium and one in Ghent in the Flemish speaking side of Belgium. The one in Ghent is the biggest one and the one that I will focus on uh, later. So um, this trans organization position themselves against the system of the gender teams. So uh, they mainly criticize the fact that the gender teams require a psychiatric consultation before the start of any medical treatment. They also criticize the, the fact that um, gender teams are, the system of gender teams is too rigid and uh, that it's too binary. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you a small quote from that article that is very explanatory of their uh, position. So uh, they wrote, trans identity is still considered a mental illness, but who knows who you are and whether or not what you say about yourself is true and by what criteria. Only you hold the keys to your identity. It is a way of putting trans people under guardianship to judge them as incapable of thinking for themselves. Jean Puriel categorically refuses to allow people to be obliged to go through a psychiatrist who evaluates their identity. Um, yes, so indeed, the. Um, approach of gender teams are very, is very different. I'm going to focus on the biggest gender team, the one that is in Kent. And um, so indeed they require a psychiatric diag diagnosis before being able to access any treatment. Uh, they work with the gender di uh, dysphoria diagnosis from the DSM-5. So they write on their website that um, for a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, the person must clearly express and experience a different gender from the one that others would ascribe to him or her. This must be the case for at least six months. In children, the desire to belong to the other gender must be present and the child must express it. According to this diagnosis, the condition causes cl clinically significant suffering, limitations in social or occupational school functioning and or in functioning in other important areas. So here I highlighted the, for at least six months um, because I found it quite striking. I, I was actually expecting they would be longer, but uh, apparently if the patient has a feeling of uh, belonging to the other gender for more than six months, then it's sufficient to access treatments. So when diagnosed with gender dysphoria, the following procedures are possible. So puberty blockers can be given from the onset of puberty. Uh, Cross-sex hormones can be given from the age of 16. A mastectomy is permitted from the age of 17. And further surgeries, uh, like uh, including sex reassignment surgeries, are available from the age of 18. Uh, on the website, puberty blockers are described simply as putting puberty on hold to give the patient time to explore their gender identity. It is stated that normal puberty will resume if they are stopped and fertility will not be affected. There is not any uh, other information on puberty blockers and on the fact that little is known about the long-term effects of such medications. Um, all of the information that I put here is the information that you can find on their website. Um, they also explain that um, they have a very long waiting list due to an increasingly high demand for transgender care. So here there's a graph where you can see um, the big increase that occurred in the number of patients accessing the clinic. Um, in red, you can see the, the amount of minors, so under the age of 18. And in blue, you can see the amount of adult patients. They further explained that because of these uh, these long waiting times, there, uh, there are two different options to transition. You can do it through the gender team and it will take longer, but you can also do it outside of the gender team. And they have a, a list of professionals that you can go to and you can contact in order to do your transition outside of the gender team. And they seem to even encourage it by saying that it is much faster to do it that way. Um, now there's also a third option for transitioning. Um, so this is uh, an option that is offered by the trans organization that I talked about earlier. They, um, because of the fact that they are in opposition to the system of gender clinics, they created their own, uh, what they call trans inter psychomedical social network. Um, so 
they, the, goal, the goal of this network is to depathologize and decentralize treatments for trans and intersex people. So uh, basically you can get in contact with this trans organization and they will give you, uh, they will redirect you to doctors that will be able to give you access to a medical transition. So for example, in my case, that's how I accessed transition. So when I was 16, they redirected me to me and my parents to a gynecologist who was specialized in prescribing hormones. And um, he reassured my, like the gynecologist talked to my parents and reassured them because they were skeptical at the time. And he said that there was no reason to wait. And he accepted to prescribe me the hormones from the first appointment. Um, now I'm gonna talk about, so what happened after I started transitioning? So I started, I started taking testosterone at the age of 15, then I got a mastectomy a few months later at the age of 17. And at the age of 20, a lot of things changed in my life and I decided to detransition. Um, my partner and I, so my partner is also a female detransitioner, we decided to create a project that is called Post Trans. And uh, it's a project from female, mainly female detransitioners to share their stories. Uh, we share their stories in many different languages and we try to give as much visibility as possible to this issue. We also try to provide resources on the topic of detransition. Um, unfortunately, in Belgium, I have tried to start the conversation about detransition, but it is very hard because the LGBTQI and trans specific organizations are in general very hostile to the topic. And I have been rejected and I have been removed from support groups uh, because of this project that I have started. Um, we recently uh, launched a booklet with information on detransition. Uh, here you can see the French and the Dutch versions of the booklet, but it also exists in English and, and German and uh, soon in Spanish and Portuguese and hopefully many other languages. You can find it on our website on posttrans.com uh, slash detransition minus booklet. Um, and uh, yeah, if you go on our website, you can uh, order copies and we can send some to your organization. With this booklet, we're really trying to raise awareness uh, on experiences of detransitioners and uh, to make a resource available, hopefully in as many organizations as possible for people who consider transition or detransition. So as a conclusion, um, based on everything that I've talked about, here are my concerns. So in, in general, I think that there's a, I, I observed that there's a big lack of spaces where lesbians can meet and exchange. And for uh, young lesbians, it's very detrimental uh, to their identity and it's really isolating in general. I also see that there's a normalization of gender nonconformity as a reason to undergo medical treatments and surgeries. Um, gender nonconforming women and gender nonconforming men and girls and boys are pushed into, are very often encouraged to take a transition path um, because of the fact that they don't fit the very strict definition of what a woman or a man should be. Uh, also, what, what I find really worrying is the very fast access to medical transition. Uh, so, for example, I, as someone who transitioned, so I came out I started my hormones and I had a mastectomy within the span of one year. And I know that it is, it is a common experience. And I think that's, that's something that is far too fast. And uh, this is really dangerous because it, it, it leads people to make decisions in a, in a rush and potentially regret them later. Um, due to the fact, as I mentioned, that um, uh, that uh, medical transition, the ways, the different, all the different ways that you can have to medically transition and the fact that it's so decentralized, it's really hard to gather data around um, the long-term effects of treatment and also around transition regret. Um, so we actually don't know, for example, in Belgium, there was, I couldn't find any data about uh, transition regret, for example, and detransition rates. That's something that's completely unknown and um, 
there is a lot of hostility towards the topic of detransition because it is said that it is something so rare and that doesn't need to be talked about. We actually don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what are the numbers and uh, because this is so difficult to be recorded. We will hear our last speaker who's uh, Yuan from Japan who, who arrived. Um, Yuan, it's over to you. My talk would be a um, Q&A session. So, but before giving my answers, I would like to raise up my voice for those Asian women who were killed by a white man in Atlanta in the US. I, I would like to just talk about this for a while. And it was really shocking news. And I used to get very upset and angry at this hate crime. And that crime was clearly a mixture of racism and sexism no matter how he denied it, it wasn't. I'd love you to be aware of how Asian women are seen in the Western societies because this is not just our problem and our problem is just like Asian problem, but it is also a problem of Western societies as well. I mean, this is how I feel, but anyway. And it felt like I was too late to speak up for ourselves because discrimination against us used to be very vague or just ignorant although this discrimination is clearer and more violent nowadays. Um, I still regret what I hadn't done anything about this ignorance since I sensed a um, subtle apathy about Asians in Western societies when I studied abroad. So again, I ask you to think about us as an individual ethnicity, a separate case, especially when you talk about fetishism fetishism towards women and I know many westerners love Asian cultures and I do appreciate it a lot because thanks to our cultures I made a lot of good friends but we are more than cultures to be honest so please know that we are also living human beings too. What is the current law and situation with gender identity ideology in Japan? And how did you realize transgenderism is a threat to women's rights? In Japan, the situation is um, when men who identify as JID, MTS women, have, and those who have finished operation and changed their family register and census, they are socially recognized as women. And if they still have male body and they are not, then they are not allowed to go into women's private spaces such as women's bathroom and like locker's room and hot, hot springs for women. And I feel that I have seen similar cases in Japan as other Western countries, like some, some women's march organization in Japan created a sign cut saying everyone's friendly feminism or we don't allow discrimination for trans women. And also according to some radical feminists on Twitter, um, trans debates got involved into trans women. Oh no, sorry. Um, trans debates got involved into women's march organization in Japan a few years ago. Then many feminists felt that the march. Um, I'm sorry. Then many feminists left the march because of that. And a similar situation happened to the flower demo, which was made for female survivors initially. However, this flower demo organization had started including trans women and men, which means um, those who have male body into the movement or the demo, um, which also caused the women to leave. After that, those who had left created another demo called fire demo. And this is, this is exclusive for biological women. And we have a lot more cases, a lot more cases. For example, um, there is a YouTuber who claimed that cross-dressers can enter women's bathroom. He even recommended to have a medical certificate to prove that they are trans women, just in case. His remark clearly showed his ignorance and hatred of women. He said that women don't want to get involved in troubles, neither do, do they have free time to call the police. So um, talking about how, how I reached the problem as well, then I basically gathered information on Twitter 
and I hadn't had an open Twitter account when I came to know this movement. However, I used a different account to browse feminism trend. And while searching these topics, I saw a, I saw a few group of people um, talking about a self ID issue. The more I studied about this trend, the more suspicious the whole movement became. And there were many problems that hadn't been answered by so-called trans allies, while legislation started being enacted. Thus, I felt a sense of crisis, which led me to start an open Twitter account and sign up for WHRC and like this, yes, this organization. Why do some people support this movement? In Japan, to watch those who don't have any questions about this quote, like trans women are women, it seems that they are trapped in an occidentalism. This is just my observation, but yeah, I think this, um, the occidentalism in Japan just, yeah, I think this plays a huge role. And um, so so-called trans allies tend to believe that the Western societies, especially English speaking countries are the best on account of our historical background after World War II. Thus, trans allies believe that Japan has to follow every trend that's happening in the US, for example. So this is why um, many Japanese people and so-called like liberal people like, treat trans transgenderism as progressive and also a correct movement. What's more, many Japanese critics of feminism support, oh, sorry, um, many Japanese critics of feminism support the trans movement as well. The thing is, we haven't developed either gender studies or women's studies as a major in Japanese universities. Um, although some universities have these courses as majors, but not as common as in the US or the US or you know, other countries all over the world. So there are fewer feminist scholar, feminism scholars, plus many of them think we have to catch up with the feminism trend in the Western societies. As far as I've seen discourses on Twitter, this is just my observation. And how do you think gender identity ideology relates to Japanese culture? I have to say that it's not directly related to Japanese culture, but however, in part, our anime culture is somehow applied to some trans women as a proof of their real self. Um, there, is, there, is, um, there is an article that's called Japanese cartoon porn helped me understand the trans identity and which explained how uh, this white man what white man realized how he was initially a woman after he found Japanese porn anime. Um, yeah, that was a surprise to me. And another example is a package of Ostrogen. It features a Japanese porn or manga, like a cartoon character. And this is a girl who looks like a little, little girl and a blessing. And this is a crucial problem to us as Japanese and Asian women. Maybe this topic can be go back to the, the speech that I just did before this question. I mean, this Q&A session happened, but um, so Japanese men's porn consumption marked the third in the world. Plus many of them protect this respectful presentation of representation of women in manga or anime which now totally affect other countries' men, I mean, other countries' men's behavior towards women, especially Asian ones. This kind of a representation of women in manga anime are now used in the, used as a, um, how do I say, as a proof of trans women and also um, the package of Ostrogen. And for me, it, looks like a, a clear line that my culture and yes this transgenderism is re somehow related to each other and it seems like they share the same view towards women 
yeah, it's like a gender stereotype or just, um, yeah, like objectification as well. In Japan, as I said, like people somehow believe that, um, believe that the self ID issue as well. And then, yeah, we, even though we don't have a law, like correct, I mean, concrete law towards this issue, however, maybe, yeah, some, yeah, organization and yeah, people can work for this movement can make this law happen. Yeah, like we have orga feminism organizations, which is against transgenderism. However, that it's kind of really difficult to show up our faces or our real name for that. I mean, for this issue. So um, I don't think it's this, um, yeah, this movement is not as big as in other countries as well. So that, for example, maybe it would be really hard to talk like this, like showing my face and my name and, you know, somehow the identification. And, you know, this is recorded as well. So I think in Japan, we are really afraid of being threatened yeah, online and in real life as well, so that we do have some organizations who are critical of transgenderism, but yeah, it's not really, yeah, how to say, in front of the line. What's happening on the ground in Israel, which is nothing short of horrifying. Um, we have been completely sold out by the quote unquote LGBT organizations because they're split into two separate funnels. One is the surrogacy, where um, all five of our Knesset members have surrogate children. So it kind of shows you what they think about women, that they go to India and Thailand and they purchase babies and they come back to Israel and then they spread their odious little message that surrogacy is totally acceptable and that babies are um, a human right and women are a commodity. It comes down to total female subordination, okay? That's what it's about in Israel. Uh, a perfect example is um, is the quote is the so-called lesbian organization's bat call, uh, which is now uh, for trans women or now is accepting uh, you know full-time female impersonators. When women actually say, "Hang on a second, this isn't right," they call us transphobic and tell us to get the get the hell out of here. This is a, a massive problem. Um, there is a man who is campaigning aggressively with the help of the LGBT organizations to be put into a women's prison. That's something that was just released um, you know, this morning. It seems as if we have to all come together and to say, okay, we cannot be fighting prostitution and porn. You know, these women can't be fighting prostitution and porn and these women can't be fighting against surrogacy. We actually, we actually all have to come together because it's one essential issue, okay? These issues are not separate. We cannot collude with men and talk with them in the Knesset when they're going off and having surrogate children like this. Um, we have to understand they have no respect for us. We have no credibility when we share platforms with these guys and say, OK, you know, uh, come and talk with us and come and talk about all of your different, um, you know, ideas and thoughts. OK, um, because it's all uh, completely and utterly connected. So is for is Israeli women, we actually have to come together um, from all political backgrounds and all perspectives uh, about this issue because it is affecting all women. It's affecting all of us. Um, we now have self-ID. We've had self-ID uh, since, uh, since uh, February 2020. Um, and this now means that uh, full-time female impersonators can get access to uh, rape shelters. They can get access to, um, you know, uh, private women-only services. Uh, th this is it, it's awful. Now, the way that it's having a, a huge problem on young women is actually in the IDF. So um, women are being drafted into a military, which is housing them with men who are pretending to be women. And there is a whole system and a whole system of organizations that are supporting this lunacy. Um, just back in November, I reported on a man pretending to be a woman in the IDF who was using the female bathroom. And it's just, um, and who, who was the villain of, of the piece? 
The villain of the piece were the two girls that complained about the man. It wasn't the man. It wasn't us saying, wait a minute, you're a man. You're pretending to be a woman, making women feel uncomfortable. And um, it, was, it was a complete inversion of, of blame. So um, I think that for the situation that I can report on in Israel is that it's just as bad as it is in every other country pretty much in the world and that we have to come uh, together, um, all backgrounds, all women, all different political spectrums and actually come and fight this because it's, it's, it's really going to um, become a beast that we can no longer tame and we can't tackle um, this complete just disrespect for our lives and rights if we don't also tackle the other issues of, of, of uh, you know of prostitution and surrogacy because it's all tied together they have no respect for us and that's why they think that we should be housed with men in prisons.